Welcome again to Pastor's Corner, the place where we use the Word of God, we eat it, we spend time with it, and we allow it to direct and guide our lives. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We are extremely happy that you are here with us as we share together. Our desire is that we grow um, spiritually, and the only way that we can grow spiritually is by spending time in this, the Word of God. Actually, the psalmist David, I was told, um, said that he um, looks at and he desires the Word of God more than his necessary food. So thank you so much for joining us. We have Elsa Watson watching from Canada. Elsa, thank you so much for joining us. We have Glenda Nicholas um, and um, Rosalind uh, Mathrin, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate that you are joining us. And um, it is beautiful, uh, beautiful and sunny weather here on um, the Isle of Spice where everything is nice. And I was told that not too long ago they said it is pure Grenada. Uh, pure Grenada, I was told the purest place um, anywhere in the Caribbean at this time. So um, we are good weather here. We have Majesty um, Seals from St. Kitts. Um, thank you so, so much. We have um, Sophia. Thank you so much, Sophia, for joining us this morning. Um, just before we ask God's guidance and presence with us, I ask you please to um, share the link with somebody. Today we have um, a solid um, program packed for you where we're going to ask some, uh, we, well, well, we'll ask some difficult questions and we'll put the um, pastors on the defense. I will see how much the pastors are able to bat yokers, you know. Um, so, um, again, if you have other questions, feel free um, to ask them in the chat. And whenever we have some time, we will be, um, we'll ask our pastors here today to answer them. So please share um, the link with somebody. Um, call somebody and let them know Pastor's Corner is on and we are here to discuss. Before I introduce our guests to men of God, just wherever you are, if you're driving, don't bow your heads, but if you are home, please bow your heads uh, with me as we pray. Loving Father, loving God, we thank you for the privilege of spending time with you in your word. And Father, as we open your word and we discuss, Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit will guide our thoughts, guide our minds. Father, be with our two pastors who are here to give us guidance and counsel from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. amen and amen. Saints of God, today in the house we have two men of God. To my extreme um, left, I have a man, a young man married um, by the name of Marlon Peters. Um, Pastor Marlon Peters, um, Grenadian by birth. Some of us are Grenadian by plane, but he's Grenadian by birth. Um, and he pastors the district of Southeast, the Southeastern district. These are churches from Wester Hall to Kroshu. That's right. All right. So, Pastor, thank you so much for being here with us this um, morning. Um, <clears throat> close to him, we have another. Grenadian by birth, a um, uh, pastor well-known within the entire um, Grenadian populace, Pastor Oliver Scott, um, who is the second in command of the work here in Grenada, as well as communication secretary, um, prayer ministries. Pastor, what else? <laughs> um, I know Pastor has a large, a large heart, Pastor. Um, and we pray for you. We pray that God gives you the wisdom and the strength and the energy, um, you know, to do what you're doing. Um, so um, he is um, second in command, um, prayer ministries, communication, and he has been doing a fantabulous job in um, whatever God has laid upon him to do. So, Pastor, thank you um, for being here this morning. Thank you so much, Pastor. It's a doing, and it's a privilege, a delight, a pleasure to be here to share this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Bishop, and it's a joy to be here once again. Amen. Thank you so much for um, being here. So, therefore, we just want to, um, before we go and I bowl the first ball, let me see whether you'll hit me for six or whether I'll put you on the defense. 
Uh, let's see what the Boeing attack will do to the um, batting order. Um, so we have um, Donna saying, thank you, God, for Grenada Mission. Well, Grenada Conference. Um, I think mission was, what, almost 20 years ago? Uh, yeah, almost 20 years ago. Um, Pastor Sconasis, thank you so much um, for joining us. And I see your, your heart, green, yellow, red. Um, thank you so much. We have Joyce C., um, saying good morning, pastors, blessings to you um, for today. We have Vanessa saying good morning, everyone. Thank you, pastors, for taking the time to educate God's sheep. Um, all right. And then we have Azel. I think I um, said it right. Azel. Um, Azel said good morning to everyone. Joycelyn Ogis, a mother of mine from St. Lucia, mother of Zion. Sir Ogis, thank you so much. I I, I realize that um, she has been faithful viewing uh, uh, Mission Live. Uh, Mission Live, Pastor's Corner, Youth Live, whatever. She's faithful in that. So, sis, thank you so much um, for, um, for being faithful. And if you're faithful, um, we may have to take you here to help us in the work here. Continue with the faithfulness. We have Alicia Stevens. Morning to all and greetings to Veronica, she says. Um, and thank you so much for um, joining us this morning. All right, so therefore we are looking at the Bible, homo, homonutics, um, how we understand the Bible. We are looking at some difficult um, passages of Scripture, some difficult questions. The first question is, the first question is, pastors, are you ready? The first question is, is it true that giants in the Bible came about as a result of angels coming down from heaven? and marrying women on earth. Now, we are told of, you know, the giants, the sons of God, they came and they slept with women and they had children, and these children um, were giants. Um, and you, you go to YouTube now, you get a lot of documentaries and videos about them and see that they were strong warriors. Now, there is a text, we'll look at Genesis. Turn your Bibles with me, Teresa. Um, um, Stedlin, turn your Bibles with me, and we'll look at Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, and then the pastors will tell us whether or not um, these giants were really um, angels. Um, so, Genesis chapter 6, we'll look at verse 2 and verse 4. It says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and took to them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord says, My spirit shall not always strive with men, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. Verse 4 says, there, was, there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, even the sons of God came in unto the daughters of, of, of men. And they bear or abort children to them. And the same became mighty men with which of old a man of renown. All right, so the Bible makes it clear that the um, sons of God went with the daughters of men and then they had giants. All right, so pastors, so tell us, um, biblically speaking, were these sons of God angels? Um, just to start off. Good morning again to all of our, our viewers. And um, last week we would have looked at the hermeneutics and the hermeneutical principles. And um, this week we, uh, we will seek to apply the hermeneutical principles. And as we would have said last week, hermeneutics is basically the science and art of biblical interpretation. All right. Um, we also established last week that Bible is its own interpreter. So I want to believe that both myself and Scott here will not be trying to make up stuff. Um, to make this scripture look pretty. The Bible has the answer for every one of us this morning. All right. Um, the question that would have just read as to whether, whether or not, um, is it true that giants in the Bible came from about as a result of angels coming down from heaven? And I want you to look at that, that text in Genesis chapter 6, um, verse 2 and 4. There are two things that stood out. Firstly, that cannot be speaking in relation to angels from heaven. Why? One. According to Matthew 20 to 30, angels cannot marry. And the Bible tells you, the context of the passage, the Bible tells you before that as ma men began to multiply upon the face of the earth, um, the sons of God joined themselves with the daughters of men. Okay. Join here seems to mean to, be, to marry. 
You join. So angels, number one, they can't marry. Together with that, because of the sinfulness that was taking place upon planet Earth at that time, God would have taken action against those persons. Okay. And therefore, it would have been impossible for God to send angels to marry men and then at the same time, after that, punish them. Together with that, uh, there are a lot of things. Scripture has its own answer. Where were the angels? Were these people in heaven marrying angels? Men, were men in heaven marrying angels up there? Or did the angels left heaven and came down here to marry men? Um, so firstly, it cannot be a literal angel that the Bible is speaking about here. When the Bible speaks of sons of men, because there are numerous aspects in the Bible, and I think Bishop Scott will expand a little bit more. There are numerous aspects in the scripture where God would have referred to his people as daughters, sons, um, even in Job, make reference to the same sons of men there. Um, when we look at the sons of men and the daughters of men here, it is making reference to the Setites because Set was considered a faithful one of God. His descendants were considered as children of God. So the Setites here would have been the sons of, the, the sons of God. And the daughters of men here would have been making a reference to the Canaanites. And what was happening is that children of God, and this is an application for all of us here today, those of us who are supposed to represent God were joining with folks that didn't want anything much to do with God. And as a result of this union, it was bringing sinful activities that, that, that heaven would have condemned. Even today, if you're going to apply the principle of the text today, we still ought to be careful as Seventh-day Adventists, and hence the reason why we still hold dear to the principle that we should not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. So the text is simply telling us here that God's people has no right with intermingling with those that are not of God. But it is not literal angel here. It is speaking about a descendant of Setite who are marrying or joining with, with, with that of the Canaanites. All right. Um, Ella, you said Setite. I mean, I know what that is, but can you tell us who are the Setites? Well, maybe Pastor Scott can elaborate on that <laughs> because I think he has more I want to get it get in okay with. okay yeah. so i guess you have um maybe you kind of um took a one run and you allowed pastor scott to back that's right <laughs> all right <laughs> well basically the um set was was a righteous man of god okay he, he served god he was faithful to god and as a result of his influence um those who came after him his descendants they continued to be faithful to god they continue to serve God. Okay. Now, so, so the sons of God there refers to the faithful people on earth, the faithful men on earth. Yes. Okay. The daughters of, of men are referring to those who walked in the flesh. Okay. So the sons of God are the children of God, those who are faithful to God. Um, their identity is wrapped up in, in God and in his righteousness. Whereas the daughters of men their identity, their characteristics, their lifestyle, they're wrapped up in sinful humanity. Okay. And so the Bible is making a distinction between people whose identity is wrapped up in righteousness and in God as against those whose identity and characteristics, lifestyle, are wrapped up in human sinful flesh. Amen. And, and we can see that in, in verse 1 because verse 1 makes it very clear that it's not angels that... Um, is the basis of the chapter, yeah. but the Bible says, and it came to pass when men mm -hmm. began to multiply, as Pastor Peter's indicated. Okay. So it's speaking clearly about men right. and not angels. But the Bible goes on in the other verses to distinguish between men who serve God and men who walked according to the flesh. Those who serve God, the descendants of Seth, they were sons of God or children of God. Mm -hmm. And today we refer to Christians and believers yeah. as children of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To as many as believe him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. Right. According to the book of John, chapter 1. So, and those who are the daughters of men who followed after the flesh. And so because of that intermarriage, where persons who should be, who, who are serving God, um, fall into the temptation of going after women who did not serve God. Here, instead of the righteous seed being sustained because of the influence of these women, you have persons now who have been multiplied who were not serving God. Right. And so the Bible speaks about the corruption that took place as a result of that intermarriage. Okay, okay. thank you so much, pastors. I think um, 
we have answered well the first question. Um, we have um, we have um, Bernard Joseph saying good morning to our pastors, um, wonderful men, faithful in the work. We have Sister Ruth Pursue saying good morning, pastors. Great explanation, Pastor Peters. And um, Sister Mason saying good morning. So um, thank you so much for joining us. Please remember to um, tell somebody about what is happening um, because we really want persons to um, study with us so that they can be able to also defend um, their faith um, when these difficult questions are asked to them. Pastors, um, thank you. Thank you so much. Now, um, let's go to question number two. At this time, we will go to our Bibles. We will um, go to the book of Timothy. All right? Um, and we will look at this time, First Timothy chapter 5. We will consider verse 23. I will read it, and then I will ask a question. All right? So, pastors, First Timothy chapter 5, um, verse um, 23. I'll read and I'll ask a question. Um, the Bible says, um, let me jump to another question. I'll jump to another question. I'll leave this one still. Okay, I, I might go ahead? All right. Okay, because I'm going to leave this one um, still. But um, let's, we will briefly answer this one. We'll briefly um, answer um, this one. That is First Timothy um, chapter 5, verse 23. Uh, the Bible says, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake, and thine own infirmities. <laughs> and thy own infirmities. Um, what did the Apostle Paul mean when he instructed Timothy to take a little wine for the stomach's sake? Well, I, when you say briefly, this one, <laughs> this one we have to understand it um, in its context. Maybe we should have mentioned the Bible cannot contradict itself. All right. The Bible, we should let our, hear, our viewers know that very clearly. The Bible cannot contradict itself. So if the Bible says one thing in Genesis, it means the very same thing in Revelation. If you are seeing anything different, you need to understand what the Bible is saying. Right. Um, so we know from Proverbs 21, wine is a marker. Right. Strong drink is raging. And whoever deceived thereby is not wise. We know the scripture would have said that. So Paul here, as the advisor to Timothy, or the one who was counseling Timothy as a young minister, Seems to be suggesting to Timothy, it is okay to drink in moderation. I mean, uh -huh. that, that is out there. Numerous denominations carry that torch with them. Saying, look, there is nothing wrong with drinking as long as you ain't get drunk. Mm -hmm. um, I put uh, a Jehovah's Witness back against the wall with that text. Because I said to him, I said, um, sir, with due respect, I would have read Proverbs 21. And the Bible tells me that wine is a mocker. Right. Strong drink is raging. And whoever deceiver thereby is not wise. I say, I read that already. So I have the knowledge, the full knowledge, that if I get drunk... That, that's a sin. I said to him, then I went and I took one shot and I got drunk and I asked him, did I sin? Mm -hmm. And he watched me and he smiled and he said, son, you, you, you're something else. <laughs> and, 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 that was a, a, and that was a real experience with me by, by shotting uh, a drink of rum punch. As a little boy, I remember it clearly. And I started to see stones spinning and all kind of a drama. <laughs> so here, getting into the passage, context of the, of, of the story. First of all, Paul was not advising Timothy that consumption of alcohol was right. When you look at the historical context of the text, it, wine here is used generically, mm -hmm. or you know, in Greek. And um, generically simply means, I can say, Pastor Scott, go down, if I tell Pastor Scott, go down by hotspot and get a bottle of wine for me. Maybe the first question he will ask, fermented or unfermented? Right. Because it is a generic term. Or you know, simply can be referred to as fermented or unfermented. And um, some person goes, well, no, I think Paul is speaking about the strong one here. Well, even if... That is your argument, because the text is not clear as to what wine Paul was making reference to. Even if Paul was stating that it was medicinal purposes. Timothy was having upset stomach, and history told us that the water he was consuming in, in those days, it was not conducive for human consumption. And as a result of consuming that water, um, folks used to always come down with belly disorder. Then we look at 100 century historians. Arians is one of them. He said that um, Ainos, making reference to the, squeeze, the freshly squeezed grape, the juice, that was also termed Ainos. May I suggest to our, our, our viewers? So when we pick the grape and we squeeze it, squeeze it, it was called Ainos, freshly squeezed in the wine press. That was Ainos. 
um, he said that normally what used to happen, that folks will collect the water and they will put a few drops of oinos in it. And that in itself was a medicine for consumption of the water. Well, I, and, and this is 100 centi, that there were two of them that attest to that fact. Oinos. So even if Paul is making reference to, and I always want to be on the side of caution, to strong drink, Paul is saying here, it is for a particular purpose. Use it for thy stomach's sake, not for recreational purposes. Mm -hmm. So we still can't run with that and say, Paul say that we could drink a like a shot. No, what is, your, what is your stomach ache? No, so Paul is not alluding to the fact for Seventh-day Adventists that we should just use alcohol for recreational purposes. Black cake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ella grumbling on me. They say, you know, we know a lot of us sometimes put a little black cake there. No, Paul is not, yeah. Paul is not, Paul is not justifying the fact that Seventh-day Adventists should be using that. And then persons go to the whole text of Matthew. Jesus turned water into wine. Well, the truth is that if you're going to use Matthew, the, the, the jars that was there, the drug that was there, it adds up to, scholars said, it can add up to about 150 gallon. And then the rational question that one can ask, are you telling me that Jesus would have created 150 gallon of jackan <laughs> for, for who to consume? <laughs> so it, it was not, it just, it just doesn't add. And um, we hear, hear the men saying afterwards that we leave the best for last. If you're drunk, you don't really actually rationalize in that kind of thinking. Yeah. You know, so, so this text in, 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 in 1 Timothy 5, 23, Paul is not giving Timothy the license to drink rum. And the last view on that is that some scholars believe that Timothy was a Nazarite. And a Nazarite doesn't even drink juice. And Timothy um, was one of the folks who held strong to the Nazarite. And that's just a sc one scholar perspective that he didn't want to partake in anything else but just consuming water, and that this was making him sick. So Paul said, brother, if we want to keep the ministry going, you have to take care of the ail ailment that you are presently having. So please, take a little one for, your, for, for the often infirmities. All right, all right. Um, so let me see if Pastor um, Scott would like to take a swing of that ball as well. Yes, um, Pastor Peters has explained excellently um, the text that we have looked at so I, I do not want to add to the explanation of the okay. text itself but as we have seen last week um in terms of the understanding of scripture we do total scriptura that's right where we looked at other bible passages as well because there is consistency in the word of god right and our greatest example on the matter of whether to use or not to use strong drink is jesus christ that is right, right. and what was his example do you remember when jesus was on the cross and they attempt to give him sour wine. Right. That was real strong wine. Strong wine. You know, mm -hmm. old wine. Yes. Fermentation would have really taken place there. Yes. And uh, how was, how was the res what was the response of Christ? The Bible shows us very clearly that he refused it. He refused it. And you can find that in Matthew uh, chapter 27. And uh, you can find it in verse 34. Jesus Christ, the Bible says, he would not drink. So, just by the example of Christ, we see that as, as believers, we must abstain from the use of fermented drinks. And there's an important question that Paul Thomas is asking there. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, most yeah. medication we take today are alcoholic, alcohol based. And here's the reason why I say we must not use alcohol for recreational purposes. Because, and that is true, a lot of the alcohol, uh, the medication that we take um, contains alcohol. Um, also, a lot of the foods that we eat contains alcohol. Hence the reason why there is no addition for it. But if there is an issue that we are having that is medically, um, I don't see anything that is wrong in us partaking in that, in that particular medicine. Okay. All right. So at this time, we will um, take uh, just a short break. Um, for those of you who know, and if you did not know, now you'll know that we have a crusade coming up. A massive online evangelistic campaign. And this is, will be virtual. And this will be with Pastor Evangelist Dr. Claudius Morgan. Um, and we just want to share with you. So at this time, we'll just play the ad and so that you um, would know about it. If you don't know, if you um, know about it, uh, it's a, a motivation and a reminder. And please remember to invite a friend. Please remember to share the link and have persons register for this campaign.
Leader Conference of Seventh day Adventist presents Good News Gospel Explosion with Evangelist Dr. Claudius Morgan. This special gospel series will be broadcast in 27 Caribbean territories, including Grenada, Caracou, and Pitti Martinique, beginning Friday, 26 February at 7 p.m. and continuing nightly. This Good News Gospel Explosion will delve into exciting topics such as Are We Ready for COVID 20? Out on Bail, Torn Between Two Lovers. Follow this series on Mission Live Grenada via YouTube and Facebook. Subscribe to Mission Live Grenada to receive notification for this grand event. Listen to the series on our online radio at www.grenadaadventist.org. This gospel explosion can also be viewed on Flow Channel 31, that's 3ABN, or any of the GBB Ministries platforms. Listen on GFN Radio 91.3 FM and 100.3 FM. Better still, download the Bovi Bible Seminars app and be part of the experience. Expect good gospel singing, prayer sessions, special features and powerful preaching from the man of God. Above all, God is offering the free gift of salvation. Remember, Good News Gospel Explosion, February 26th at 7 p.m. and continuing nightly. Make it a date. It will be thrilling and exciting. Our full series. So please invite your friends, invite your loved ones. Um, the link would be sent every night if... Um, if you want to know exactly how you can receive it, you can talk to your pastor about it. Um, or you can just write here on Mission Live and Facebook um, every night at 7 um, p.m. Um, we um, would be live. All right. So we are asking um, that you please, please um, like um, our page, subscribe. So as soon as we go live, you would be notified. As well as immediately in the chat, we are sharing with you the link to register. If you register, you would be receiving information and we can keep in contact with you and share with you. So just click the link. If you click the link, you would receive the good news, gospel explosion registration form. So you would share, write your name, your email address. Um, the email address is not mandatory, so if you don't have an email address, that is fine. Share with us your telephone number, um, whether it's your house number or your WhatsApp number. Also, you share with us whether you are Seventh-day Adventist or you are not. Somebody will contact you. Somebody um, will get in touch with you, please. Now, what we're asking as well, for those of you who are li um, listening right now who are going to register that you also do something for us we're asking you now to speak to a family member your auntie your brother your uncle wherever that person is and share the link with them and ask them to register and if they um, are not able to register you get their permission and you register them yourself we want everybody in grenada now um those of you who um may not have access to internet, um, so you are not able to view on Mission Live or on our Facebook or our YouTube page. You can um, listen on Family Life Radio. I think Family Life Radio is 90... 91.3. Thank you so much, Pastor Scott. 91.3. And you can also um, listen to um, those in the north um, Kariko, Peter Matnik, you can also listen on Real FM. Um, and also, those of you who have cable, um, feel free, feel free to join us on um, Flow 31. Flow 31, which is, well, the local um, 3ABN channel. So, therefore, the conference has tried our, um, its best to ensure that almost Every ground is covered that everyone can um, view or listen to this powerful evangelistic series. And if you did not know, it begins this Friday night, um, February 26th at 7 p.m. 7 p.m. February 26th. All right. We are now back. So let's see what a few of our viewers are saying. 
um, Morel, I think David from St. Lucia, welcome. Um, and um, those of us, those who don't know, um, we, we actually celebrate Independence Day same month with Grenada. Grenada is the 7th and we are the 22nd. Um, um, Grenada celebrated 47, 47 years this year and we celebrated um, 42. So we are just, what, five years trailing behind um, Grenada. So St. Lucian's happy belated um, independence. And Grenadians, although it was the seventh, but still happy uh, <laughs> belated um, independence celebration. All right. So we have um, Paris saying, should we drink grape wine when it is fermented? Should we drink grape wine now, there is also, uh, let me add to that since um, Paris brought that pastor. I know um, in St. Lucia, I call it the Adventist wine. And that is, there is kind of red, small um, thing in, in a tree. And they normally take it and put it in a, a bottle or something for water and some yeast. And put it under the bed. <laughs> and they wait for like December or so. And they say because it is not... Um, rum from the distillery. Um, some persons say that they can, they can consume it. So, along with that question, can these things be consumed? Well, I, <laughs> if, if I don't, if we don't answer this question, I know when I reach home, she will call me. That's Tanya's, <laughs> that's Tanya's mom. Eh? Okay, okay. <laughs> um, you answer the question. You're asking the question, and you're answering it. Once it is fermented, it turns alcohol. Okay. Once it's fermented, it's turned alcohol, and not because it is not created from the distillery. It doesn't mean that it is okay to drink. Um, I remember creating alcohol for one of our school projects by just using some cane with some yeast and soak for 21 days. It turns alcohol and strong rum. And today, persons mm, making sorrel wine and all sorts of wine, golden apple wine. Once we leave the natural use of the fruit and put it to ferment, it turns into alcohol, and it is not good for our system. The Bible condemns it. All right, all right. So here you have um, gotten the answer. And maybe there might be other persons, pastors, who may have had that same yeah. um, question um, as well. Now, um, somebody said, Glenda Nicholas um, said that freshly squeezed juice is delicious and is not fermented to erode and poison our That's body. Right. That's Amen. Right. That's a sermon um, in itself. That's a sermon in itself. All right, so let's go to question number three. Question number three. If West Indies um, batted all the time like our two pastors are batting for the Lord, they would have won every game. <laughs> they would have won every game. All right, so number three says, now um, for this one, we need to go back to the Bible. We need to go back to the Bible. And again, I will read and I'll ask the question. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, pastors. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. And it says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? I'll read again, pastors. It says, Who is the image of the invisible one, the firstborn of every creature? And that is talking about Jesus. All right? So it says that Jesus is the firstborn of every creature. That's what the Bible says. My question, does the Bible teach that Jesus was the firstborn of all creation? And as a created being, not coexistent with the Father from eternity? All right, so that's a very good question. And uh, let's look at the text closely. Um, the Bible speaks in the reference to Christ here as the firstborn. Now, we have to understand the context of Scripture if we are going to interpret the Scripture well. And so, the concept of first in the Bible is not only used in terms of chronology, All right. but the word first is also used in terms of rank okay. and status. And, and that is not just reserved to the Bible, but even in our present context, we also use first, not just in chronology, mm -hmm. but also in terms of rank. That's I'll it. give you two examples. Mm -hmm. um, in the United States of America, for example, the wife of the president is referred to as what? The first lady. The first lady. Mm -hmm. Does it mean that Mrs. Biden is the first lady born in the U.S.? <laughs> 
Good question. Of course not. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Um, but she's referred to as first lady because she's married to the president. Okay, that's right. So she's a first in rank. That's it. Um, in our local churches, for example, we refer to the head elder mm-hmm. as the first elder. First elder. Mm-hmm. So he's not the. F- there's some young first elders. <laughs> yes. So he's not the first elder in terms of the f- oldest person in the church. Right. But he's a first elder because among the eldership. He ranks the highest. He's a leader. He's All a right. head elder. Okay. So, first is used in the context of rank and nej- not just chronology. Right. Um, so, in terms of Jesus Christ being referred to as the firstborn, Jesus Christ is referred to as first in the context of his rank. Okay. In comparison to other human beings, Jesus Christ is unique. He's special. He's outstanding. Mm-hmm. What makes him outstanding? What makes him the first of rank? What makes him outstanding is his divinity. All right. His divinity is what separates him from other human beings. Mm-hmm. Other human beings have o- that human um, context, but Jesus Christ, he is first in rank in the context of him being divine. Right. And we can see it in, in the, the, uh, the f- verse that follows because it says very clearly, mm-hmm. for by him uh-huh. were all things created. created yes, sir. So the other persons um, are spoken of in relation to Christ. And in, when they're spoken of in relation to Christ, Jesus Christ is creator. All right. So it says here, for by him were all things created. And it says all things mm-hmm. that are in heaven mm-hmm. and that they're in the earth, visible and invisible. It goes on to say all things were created by him and for him. And watch verse 17. And he's before all things. All things. Mm-hmm. And by him, all, all things, things consist. consist. Mm-hmm. So Jesus Christ is first in the context of his rank. What makes him so special as rela- in relation to other human beings is that he is divine. And it is shown by the fact that he is creator. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Scott. Pastor Peters. I think Pastor Scott was very, very clear. I mean, I really and truly like the, um, the way he explained the text. Um, just together with what Pastor Scott would have highlighted, um, the mere fact that some persons will use this test, text to formulate their theory um, as to whether or whether or not Jesus himself were created. Um, the Greek term that is used here, prototokos, does not speak to the idea that he was created. Rather, he speaks of Jesus in this particular text as the incarnate one or, or the God coming in the form of man as we, as we know. But understanding the historical analysis of this text, preacher, um, when I look at the history, Paul was addressing um, some believers with some serious concerns of the day. What was the concerns of the day? There were persons who were illegitimizing the supremacy of God. They were saying that Jesus was not God and Jesus was created. And Paul had to debunk that theory. And here he speaks of the firstborn, as Pastor Scott rightly says, not in in the aspect of chronology. But in the fact that Jesus has all supreme power and authority, privileges. Mm-hmm. He, he aligned Prototokos here as the person that has everything, has all power, has all authority. And the text that follows states that clearly. That if we're going to use that text to say that he was created, then you have to get rid of all the texts that follow. Right. All the texts that follow by him were all things created. You have to get rid of that if you are saying that he was created. Because for him to create that, it simply means that he has to be in existence before the things that he would have created. So to say that Jesus was created by something, you have to get rid of the thing first before you, you, we address that issue. So I think Pastor Scott was on, on ball here. And the text is speaking to a particular issue that Jesus contains all and full authority um, to, to, to do whatever he chooses to do in, the, in these times. All right, thank you so much, pastors. Now, um, somebody asked, uh, well, two questions, but um, the pastors, you would have answered, um, I think, the first one. I think you made it clear that Jesus um, was not created. Right. Um, just for um, asking, um, the person says, was, or was he, was, um, he, did he coexist? Okay, so, so that, that's, that's a very, very easy question. Yes. Right. <laughs> um, and, and th- to answer that question, we, we can reference the book of John, um, chapter 1. 
right? Um, John chapter 1. And I'm, I'm just going to go there, try to be as, 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 as quick with it as I can. The Bible says from verse 1, it speaks of in the beginning was the Word. Mm-hmm. And the Word was with God. All right. Of course, the Word here refers to Jesus Christ. Yes, yes right? sir. And it, it says of him that he was there in the beginning. Mm-hmm. And the Word was with God. So it shows here that he coexisted with the Father. That's the question that's been asked. And the answer has been given here. That in the beginning, he, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right. So Jesus Christ was always in existence. That's right. Um, Jesus Christ did not have a beginning, but instead he is the beginner of all things. Amen. That's right. Right? So he was there in eternity past. Before there was a when or a where, he is there. Yes, sir. And so Jesus Christ is the beginner. When we look at the text, he is he's coexisting with the Father. He is with God. And he is God. Amen. The Bible says, and the word was God. And it, it, it expounds on it some more in the other verses. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was, was made. made. In him was life. And life was, and the life was light of men. So in him was life. So he was not given life. That's right. In him was life. Was life. So Jesus Christ, who existed with the Father, um, as he said, he um, I and the Father are one. Amen. Amen. And one of my favorite authors says that he has life unborrowed. That's right. And underived. So pastors, um, I have heard over the years of the. Um, of a saying that says, one saved, always saved. The moment you enter the boat, you're safe, always saved. And um, some persons use, um, pastors, the book of John. We'll go to that. Um, we'll go back to where Pastor Scott was. Um, and the chapter, this time is 10 and verse 28. And they use that to say that whenever you are Saved once, you are always saved. And he says, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So the pastor, um, pastor, the question that came in, does the Bible teach that once you come to Jesus, you can never lose your salvation? Is it correct to come to conclude that John chapter 10, verse 28 teaches, once saved means always saved. Um, Pastor, if I'm going to attempt to answer the question, it's a dangerous premise um, to even consider the idea to teach such a gospel. All right. um, simple put, an individual can accept Jesus as a baby and then just re- live a life of reveling after that, because Jesus would have already saved you as a baby. You can do whatever you want after that, you're already saved. Um, that will contradict other parts of the scripture, because the Bible even tells us that in case we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it, in other words, we, need to, we can go back to the advocate, make it right again. Now, if that possibility doesn't exist, um, it simply means that damnation for us. Mm-hmm. But, but if one save, always save, then the Bible ought to be saying something different there. Now, Jesus, a child who accepts Jesus, according to John chapter 28, John chapter number 10, verse 28, one who accepts Jesus and, G- and abides in the principles of Jesus are, are covered by the presence of Jesus. All right. okay, the Bible puts it so in Psalms. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadows of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge and my fortress, my God in him will I trust. In other words, once we are imbued with the principles of God and following and being obedient to the will of God, God protects us. Mm-hmm. So here, the Bible is making reference to, um, no one can snatch you away from my hand. Even the devil is included in that no one. Once God is covering us, the devil cannot, and the Bible shows us that with Job. Mm-hmm. Devil has to go to God and ask him for permission to address Job. Because God was well protecting Job perfect scenario for the Christian. When we abide under the principles of God, he protects us. Um, But it does not negate the fact that even though God is able to save the sheep, it is the sheep's choice to live if they so choose. 
The devil cannot snatch us out of God's hand. But it is that very sheep that is in God's hand can choose whether to stay there or to leave his presence. So the text is not saying, well, once God covers you, then um, that is it for life. It is our responsibility to ensure there is a consistent and persistent relationship with God so that God can continue to cover us. Many times we are in the hands of God and we do our own things and go far away from him. And that's where our sheep, the sheep now will go astray. As sheep, we must be concerned with the very fact that to remain in the presence of God calls for a daily submission to the will of God. Ellen White puts it this way. She says that we must consecrate our hands, our lives in the hands of God every single day. She said the day that we do not do it is the very day that the devil already planned for us on that day. Um, Pastor Scott? Yes, um, beautifully um, expressed, um, Pastor Peters. And when we read the Bible, we see that it's possible for someone who is righteous to turn away from the righteousness. Okay. Um, we have Saul as a great example. That's right. Who was with God, mm -hmm. but then he chose to go the path of unrighteousness. That is right. So it's possible for a righteous person to turn from his righteousness. In fact, in Ezekiel, um, the Bible makes it very clear. Therefore, thou son of man, say unto the children of thy people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. Okay. So if you're a righteous person and you choose to go the path of righteousness, you do not, you, it does not mean that you are in a safe state. Okay. Um, if you turn from your righteousness to go the path of sin, you are lost, and so therefore you face the natural consequence of being lost. That's right. um, when it comes to the text that, that we are looking at right now, um, the, in, the, in the previous verse, the Bible makes it clear who it is be, who is being referred to. The Bible says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow, follow me. me. That's Amen. Right. The text is not, th did not say they followed him. Mm -hmm. But these people continue to follow Christ. Amen. In other words, once a believer continues to follow Christ, no one is able to change his destination. Amen. He is saved, and uh, the kingdom of God is his inheritance. Um, as a matter of fact, the text is not, is not a difficult text. We examine it very closely because it says, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man Plug them out of my hand. So for the believer, no one can take away our salvation. No. No, no, no man gave us salvation. That's right. Therefore, no man could remove our salvation or pluck us from the hand of God. What will change our destination is our personal choice. Amen. No man but our personal choice. That's right. And so in Hebrews chapter 10, my, my last text, Hebrews chapter 10, the Bible shows us that it's very possible for someone who was walking in Christ to turn from the righteousness mm. and face the natural consequence. So therefore, the Bible makes it clear that one saved is not always saved. Right. Hebrews 10, um, from verse 36, it says, For ye have need of patience, that means perseverance, continuing right. in Christ, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. So the promise is for those who continue to yes. persevere. That's it. Right? Then verses 38 and 39. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, mm. you change your mind, you turn from your righteousness, my soul shall have no pleasure in him, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. Mm -hmm. So the Bible is very clear, those who draw back, those who turn from the righteousness, they are going the path of perdition, wow. destruction, but we are of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Yeah. Amen. 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 These powerful pastors, thank you so much. At this time, we'll take another break where we would listen to some young people, the youth of the St. David's Church, as they bless our hearts, they serenade our hearts today with good gospel music. The other valley, let your sweet aroma fill my life. Rose of Sharon, show me. How to grow in beauty in God's sight. 
fairest of 10,000, make me a reflection of your light, of your light. Day star shine down on me, let your love shine through me in the by the years of past defeat. But when I see you standing near me with compassion in your eyes, in your eyes, Jesus shine down on me. Let your love shine through me in the shined on, on me. Um, Lily of the Valley. That's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful song. Um, pastors, we are back. Um, the other question that we have in here today is based upon Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, um, which goes like this. 
Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body of Christ. According to the Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, is Sabbath keeping unnecessary? Um, this text, there are, there are some major sects today and, and denominations that use this text um, to justify that Sabbath keeping is not for us today. And they reference Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. The text it is self-explanatory. The answer is in the text. Let no man judge you in meat and eat and drink and holy things or holy day. When you look at the text, Paul makes reference to meat and drink. Within the ceremonial system, there were particular foods assigned to ceremonial uh, meetings. Note well also from the text, Paul is saying for all these, these shall be a shadow of things to come. Which is to state, it cannot be speaking in reference to the moral law as we are making reference to the holy days. Because the moral law is for to stand forever. It ought not to move. Paul uses some, and in this text he's making reference to ceremonial ordinances such like the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the Day of Pentecost, the Day of Atonement, the Passover, the Feast of of tabernacles. All these were ceremonies that were supposed to be performed by the children of Israel, but their fulfillment would have met it on the, met on the cross when Jesus died. The fulfillment for these um, ceremonial system ended at the cross. So when Paul was making reference to let no man judge in holy days, we're speaking on holy days because the answer, the question is in relation to the Sabbath. He was not making reference to the seventh day Sabbath. But he was making reference to the ceremonial Sabbath. As a matter of fact, the word that is used for Sabbath is, is, is Shabbat. It is plural, which is not speaking in reference to a singular Sabbath or the, the weekly cycle Sabbath. It is make, making reference to the ceremonial Sabbaths. So this text, it is not to justify that Sabbath keeping is not for us today. But Paul concluded in the next verse, for all these shall be a shadow of things to come. A shadow simply means it was anti-type pointing to type. Anti-type simply means that its fulfillment would have come on the cross. And as G when Jesus died, all these things would have been ended. But not the weekly, holy, seven-day Sabbath of the Lord thy God. This will be established forever and forever. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much, Pastor. Now, um, our... Time is basically up, so we have time for only one question, and I have many, so I will just take one out of the box um, or out of the heart today, and I think that one's a very interesting one. Um, let me read the text, Deuteronomy chapter 22. Um, I'll read the text, and let's see, uh, and then I'll ask the question, and the pastor, um, whoever would decide to answer that one. So, it's 22. Verse 5, the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto thy Lord. So therefore, pastors, our last question for today, does the Bible condemn or prohibit the wearing of pants for female? Does the Bible condemn or prohibit the wearing of pants for females? Please explain Germany chapter 2 verse 22, sorry, verse 5. Interesting question indeed. And the question asks about pants. Yes. Um, the, the truth is that when, when we read a text, we do not see the word pants there. That's right. <laughs> <All> right. <laughs> uh, as, as a matter of fact, um, in, the, in the context of, of the text, um, in those days and in that part of the world, pants was not trending. <laughs> I chose to use that word. Okay. Pants was not trending. Uh, um, the word for garment that is used there comes from the Hebrew word similar, which refers to a square piece of cloth that was used as a wrap. Okay. You know, we speak about wrap today. Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, in our culture, um, women are the ones that use wraps. Okay. Um, however, 
In, in Bible times, men also use wraps. Okay. As a matter of fact, even today, in other parts of the world, like in India, men use wraps. Okay. So there was a distinction between the wrap that belonged to the man as against the wrap that belonged to the woman. Oh. And so the Bible is saying that the man should not wear a woman's wrap or woman's garment. That's right. And a woman should not wear a man's wrap or a man's garment. So if the garment is tailored and made and designed for the man, it is not to be worn by the woman. Mm. If it is made and tailored, designed for the woman, it is not to be worn by the man. So it's not limited to pants, All right. but it includes pants. Okay. So a uh, man should not wear a pants that is designed, made, and tailored for a woman. A woman. Otherwise, you'll say something wrong. <laughs> If or the woman should not wear a pants that was made, tailored, and designed for the woman. The same applies to things like T-shirts, jerseys, jackets, as the case may be. Right. Um, once it is made, designed, and tailored for the female, the, ma the male should not wear it because he will appear feminine. Yes. And the uh, woman should not wear that which is made, designed for the woman because she would appear male-like. Mm. And, and so one of the reasons why God gave that command is to make a clear distinction between male and female. Right. If you're a man, you're supposed to be and look like a man. Yes, That's right. right. You're a woman, you be and look like a woman. True. And so there shouldn't be no mix-up yes. in terms of the sexes. And it's interesting that recently um, we came out of a certain place and there was a lady just like a man. Man's pants, man's top. And my, my 10-year-old daughter, when she came out of the place, speaking about the woman, she said of the woman that that, that woman, she wants to be a man. <laughs> wow. you, you understand? Right, right. Because she w was wearing garments that wa was des were designed for men. Mm -hmm. And so the Bible is speaking against it. So the text says, the woman shall not wear that which, is, which pertaineth unto a man. Neither shall the man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. So the Bible is clear. It speaks clearly against cross-dressing. Mm -hmm. And it also speaks against the whole issue of homosexuality and lesbianism um, as well. Uh, thank you so much, Pastor. Thank you so much, Pastors, for being with us today. For explaining, actually, um, Alicia says, "Catch, um, catch you, catch you." That means you really understood your explanation. So, Pastor, again, thank you for being here. Um, they're saying that the time is too short. We need more time, Pastors. But please join us every Tuesday at the same time. We are will be here as we discuss with you and share with you. Um, Agnes says, "Thank you, Pastor Scott, Pastor Peter." and the other pastor. Thank you so much. We really appreciate being here with you, and you um, are welcome. Um, before we leave, we just want to um, thank God for his wisdom and for his spirit. Father, Lord, today we thank you. We glorify your name, Lord. We thank you for your word. And Father, Lord, as we end this program today, we pray that your word would have gone out, and Lord, hearts would be transformed, and men and women would have been motivated to spend more time in your word. Thank you, Lord. In just name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us again, pastors. Thank you. We will end with the promotion for the crusade. We need you to share this information. Share it with a friend. Share it with a loved one. Let them know that the greatest and grandest event begins on the 26th of February, 2021. The Conference of Seventh-day Adventist presents Good News Gospel Explosion with Evangelist Dr. Claudius Morgan. This special gospel series will be broadcast in 27 Caribbean territories, including Grenada, Caracou, and Pitti Martinique, beginning Friday, 26 February at 7 p.m. and continuing nightly. This Good News Gospel Explosion will delve into exciting topics such as Are We Ready for COVID-20? Out on Bail, Torn Between Two Lovers. Follow this series on Mission Live Grenada via YouTube and Facebook. Subscribe to Mission Live Grenada to receive notification for this grand event. Listen to the series on our online radio at www.grenadaadventist.org. 
This gospel explosion can also be viewed on Flow Channel 31, that's 3ABN, or any of the GBB Ministries platforms. Listen on GFN Radio 91.3 FM and 100.3 FM. Better still, download the Bovi Bible Seminars app and be part of the experience. Expect good gospel singing, prayer sessions, special features, and powerful preaching from the man of God. Above all, God is offering the free gift of salvation. Remember, Good News Gospel Explosion, February 26 at 7 p.m. and continuing nightly. Make it a date. It will be thrilling and exciting. Out of the kingdom of God.